Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Ross. I'm an F1 uh, working in Inverness in the Highlands. Uh, and today I'm joined by Ella, who is uh, an F2 specialising in research in London, and Hannah, who is an F2 specialising in medical education based in Sheffield. Um, we've got a webinar today kind of themed about choosing your SFP, so less about um, the, the, the details in terms of when to apply and how to apply, but just um, giving you more of a taste of what SFP programmes um, can offer and if they are the right thing for you. But if you have any questions at all, feel free to ask in the chat. Um, we're keeping an eye on that um, and we'll answer them for you. We've got a pre-course questionnaire. This is the same one. If, you, if, you, if this is not your first webinar um, with Access to AFP, you likely have done this already. But if this is your first time joining us, please do fill out um, the questionnaire. Uh, with it's just useful for us in terms of knowing if, if this um, webinar series is achieving what we wanted to and also just for um, what we can improve um, next time around. So I'll just hold that there for a wee second and you can uh, access that. Okay. I could probably should put that link in the chat as well. I'll, I'll do that just now. Okay, so this is the outline of the talk we're going to give today. Um, about, I'm going to give about half of it and then Ella, we're going to swap over and Ella will deliver the other half. Um, and I think Hannah's going to chip in as well because um, she's, she's obviously doing the, the medical education SFP as well this year. Um, we're going to remind you about um, key information and dates, so in terms of applying, how the, the application kind of process goes, and when you can expect to hear back. And we're going to talk a little bit about what an SFP offers and perhaps more importantly, what it doesn't offer. And um, it's a little bit of managing expectations. And then we're going to encourage you to think about why, why you want to do this, um, because it's not a, a decision to be taken lightly. Um, and you know, deciding that you don't want to do the SFP is, is perfectly valid as well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of the three disciplines of SFP, so research, medical education and leadership um, and what they offer and sort of things you can expect to do um, in those posts. And then we'll give some of our own personal anecdotes and um, anecdotes that we've collected um, from friends and, and colleagues who are doing the, the SFP as well, or have done it in the past. Um, and then we'll have time for questions. So here is a reminder of your key information and dates. So specialised foundation programme, and um, there are three broad um, kind of arms of that. There's the research posts, medical education posts, and leadership posts. You can apply for up to two, what I'm going to call deaneries. Um, so I think it stands for specialised unit of application. Um, there is Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and then I think 17 or 18 in England. Um, you can apply for up to two of those um, in one cycle. You do that through Oreo, which is uh, the, the website that you'll be applying for the, the foundation programme um, through as well. So you upload your evidence, you upload answers to your white space questions, and then if you're successful, you go on to interview and can rank your jobs. And the format of that will vary by where you apply um, and what you go for. There's loads and loads of useful information on the Foundation Programme website, um, including the, you know, how the, the interviews are formatted, um, whether they'll be online or in person, um, and how many posts are available in, in each uh, discipline for SFP. And the good thing is, once you've been through all that, uh, you can expect to hear back in kind of early, early 2023. Um, so you might have to hear back about your, your first job um, a little earlier than your colleagues do. So I think part of, part of this talk, we wanted to talk about expectations and how to manage them. Um, and I thought this was quite a good way to think about it. So what to expect and what not to expect. So on the left here, the SFP gives you a chance to select where you want to go, essentially. So. Um, for me, I was I was fairly, you know, um, keen on a job 
in Scotland and more specifically the north of Scotland and targeting an SFP um, job up here allowed me to, to do that. Um, and, you know, in terms of clinical specialties um, and rotations as well. Um, and obviously, if you're successful, you hear back um, at the beginning of, the, of next year as opposed to April, May time. Um, the SIP offers you dedicated time to explore uh, you know, an area of academia that you're interested in, so research, teaching, leadership, and that may be in the form of uh, day reliefs, so one day, dedicated one day per week um, academic time, or it may be a, a dedicated post, so um, four, four months out of F2 to um, pursue research or teach. And obviously doing the SFP, um, if you're academically minded and you want to build a CV, um, it's going to look really good on that as well. This more applies, I think a really important point to, to, to make clear is that even though you're going for a programme that is separate from the foundation programme through Oreo, you, you do still need to sit and, and pass the SJT. So to be very clear, you cannot, you cannot um, bypass the SJT by applying for a uh, specialised foundation programme. You need to pass that um, in your final year of medical school. You shouldn't expect uh, two years of foundation programme that are purely academic. That's not how it works. So we all slot into the NHS just the same as um, junior doctors that go through the foundation programme allocation. Um, and, you know, it's expected that you're working on your clinical competencies, you're learning how to be a good doctor, um, and your academic interests, while they're important, um, do not make up the majority of your time spent working, so um, keep that in mind. Also linked to that is the fact that because you have less clinical time, so whether it's that one day out a week or four, four months out in F2 or whatever the arrangement is, you still need to achieve the same clinical competencies in that time. So in terms of um, taking histories from patients, managing patients, performing procedures, you still need to be able to do that to the same level as uh, you know, an end of year F1 or F2, but you have less time essentially. So you really need to be on it in terms of your learning and um, portfolios. So should ask in Scotland or, or I think it's Horace elsewhere, and keeping on top of all that because you're going to have less time to, to complete that. And while some of the SFP posts offer um, funded postgraduate qualifications, so things like PG Cert, PG Dip, or Masters, um, you, you shouldn't really expect that. So it, it may be a, a you know, happy bonus, but in, in terms of my own um, program, they, they don't fund your, your postgraduate qualifications. So you need to pursue them by yourself. So you'll likely have, have thought about this quite a lot, um, especially if you're approaching applying, applying for the SFP, but why, why do you specifically want to do this and, and what do you think that the benefit will be? Um, I think that's a really important thing to consider um, and you know, while you're going through this process. I've made a little table of things that, that you might have been thinking about um, or you know, um, have thought about already. And more on the left hand side are the more general things. So, you know, in terms of where you live, um, are you close to family and friends? Are you moving down, you know, are you moving somewhere with friends from university? Or are you going out alone? Have you thought about these things and, and you know, to the degree to which they matter to you? Um, location as well. So, um, do you want to live in a metropolitan area? Do you want to work remote and rural? Um, do you want to find something in between? You know, do you want to go home or do you want to, you know, strike out and go elsewhere in the country? And obviously, as, as we'll all be thinking about at the moment, financial um, implications of where you work as well. So the cost of living is going up and tends to be, the, with a few exceptions, the closer to London you go, the more expensive it will be to, to live. Um, and it'll, that'll be re reflected in your, your, your wages as well. But it's always something to consider you, you know, in terms of renting um, or um, where you're going to be living and things. And that brings me on to the last point, which is accommodation and how you're going to get to work. So, you know, do you want to live in hospital accommodation? Do you want to rent somewhere privately? 
you know, how do you plan on getting to work? So are you going to use public transport? Are you going to get the tube? Do you want to cycle or have you got a car? These are all things that you should maybe think about. Um, and I think anybody going for a foundation job would, would think about um, before starting. So on the right are things a wee bit more specific to SFP. Um, pardon me. So obviously if you've got an academic interest um, in a specific area of research, it would maybe be of interest to you to pursue an SFP programme that, that lets you um, experience that. So there are SFP specific to surgery and there's SFP specific to certain specialties of medicine. And if you know that one place offers that, then that'll rank quite highly in whether you go for it or not. Your clinical interests as well. So um, when I applied for SFP, because there are fewer, there are fewer jobs and, and you're ranking fewer jobs, you have a, a better chance to sort of scrutinise the, the rotations that you're given. So my posts are all quite general. Um, I'm doing a lot of gen, general medicine and a lot of general surgery. Um, with GP um, and rural medicine in there as well. So um, it's a very generalised um, set of jobs. But if you wanted to do, for example, haematology, um, and you were very interested in haematology and you saw that there was a specific SFP rotation that offered that, um, that might play into your thinking. If you've been working with a supervisor or, or you've you know, enjoyed um, you know, working at a specific centre of, of excellence in some area of research um, and you want to continue working with them, it would naturally make sense that you, you picked a job um, in, in greater proximity to that. Um, and also just in terms of where you plan on working in the future. Um, although I should be, make it very clear that it is totally okay not to know what you're, you're wanting to do beyond F2 at this point. Um, I know I don't. So um, these are all things that might play into your thinking, they might not. I'll put down here at the bottom competition ratios. Um, so similar to um, when you're applying for specialty training, there is lots and lots of data available on the number of people who apply for a post versus the number of people who get one. Um, I don't know if you can see there. And um, if you look at those ratios, you'll see lots of depressing numbers. I would, I would encourage you not to think about that um, too, too close or not look at that too closely. Um, although if you want to be pragmatic and practical, obviously I'd say apply for an SFP post that is less competitive. Um, but at the end of the day, you want, to, you want to be doing something that you enjoy and you have an interest in. And if that is um, you know, in a heavily competitive post or theory, so be it. I would just apply for it anyway and see, see where you end up. Um, and remember, you can, you can apply for two deaneries um, maximum, so you have the chance to sort of um, mingle in and, and apply for different things. <coughs> That's just a quick overview of the, the, the posts that were offered by each deanery in 2022. You'll see a lot of England is primarily research focused, um, but there are increasing numbers of medical education and leadership posts. Um, appearing now. And actually, if you look at uh, the Trent Deanery, there's actually um, specialised psych psychiatry posts as well. So you can see that it's all kind of changing um, in, in these deaneries. Um, and this might influence where you want to go as well, and um, depending on the number of posts available and what you want to do. Okay, so if there aren't any questions at that point, I'll pass on to Ella, who's going to talk a wee bit about the different themes of SFP. Cool, thank you so much. Um, so in the next 15 minutes, I'm just going to go through the three main themes, um, as Ross alluded to. Um, so the three different themes are research, medical education, and then leadership and management. And some deaneries do offer slight variations on this, like Trent, which offers the post in psychiatry. And I think some offer some in informatics as well. Um, the information on the 2023 posts aren't yet available on the, on the UK FPO website, but when we email you your certificates at the end, I'll put the link for that website in there and just keep checking back in the next few weeks, um, because each of the deaneries do offer quite different posts. And I guess it's quite personal where you want to apply, so I'd advise just keep looking for that um, at that website, because there is really good information. 
Um, so with all the different themes, with the Specialised Foundation programme in general, the things that they have in common is dedicated time to develop skills which are um, above, like just additional to the skills required in the normal foundation programme. Um, and this can either be in the form of one four month block or days dispersed throughout. Um, and you will have a supervisor allocated either to oversee your research or medical education or leadership project. Um, and most of them are connected to a university as well. So you have access to the university and the facilities available there. And um, this is a really great document, which is again available on the UK Foundation Programme website, which goes through the three different um, themes and sort of learning outcomes for each, which we'll go through in the next few slides. Um, but it's really important to note that they're not mutually exclusive at all. And by doing a, for example, medical education post, as we'll talk about a bit later on, there's still lots of opportunity to do research and be involved with leadership. And the same with doing a research post. Um, it's just the sort of focus of the post is a bit different. Um, can have the next slide, please? Um, so research is still the one where the most posts are offered um, and it varies in each deanery, but I think the most common way that it's formatted is a four month block in F2. Some will have on-call commitments still in this and others won't. And some are more flexible than others with the type of research project that they offer. Um, so generally some of the learning outcomes of this four month rotation might be writing a protocol, applying for funding, applying for ethics, right, um, and then sort of over overseeing the project, writing it up and at a latter stage presenting and or publishing it. Um, and generally you will be given an academic supervisor who oversees this. Um, some deaneries, again, it will vary and I would go on the UK Foundation Programme website and look at the deaneries that you're more interested in and they'll have links to the university and normally we'll give quite a lot of detail about sort of what they offer in terms of teaching and additional postgraduate qualifications such as PG certs. Um, so talking a bit about the one that I'm doing, so I'm in St George's in London um, and I've got a renal academic block which I'm going to start in December um, it's I've really enjoyed it since I've started as an F1. I've had like weekly academic um, meetings with my supervisor. I've quite often not been able to attend, but that's what he sort of um, aims for to get us all together to discuss different projects that are going on. And we've had quite a lot of input um, from the beginning of F1, which has been really useful. There's also monthly academic teaching um, where I, we've had teaching on things like research ethics, and more practical things like calculating um, sample sizes and then diff various different talks from academics which have been really interesting. Um, and St George's do also did that you have to apply and it's quite a not every it's quite a competitive process but you can apply to get that. Um, yeah, and I, I would really recommend it. And if anyone's got any specific questions, we can take it at the end. And again, on the email with your attendance certificate, I'll put my email. So if anyone's got any specific questions, please feel free to get in touch. Um, so the next theme is medical education. So the focus on with this theme is sort of enhancing skills as a trainer and educator, which are really enormously useful skills in a wide range of specialities throughout your career. Um, it can involve lots of different things such as creating and managing a teaching programme, which might be undergraduate or postgraduate, um, working on and enhancing the curriculum, various different education specific research projects, um, participating in selection process to medical degree programmes and developing and assessing assessment tools. And then these are some examples again are all widely available online by going through the UK Foundation Programme website um, but just give it a bit of a flavour of what some of the different ones offer and I think um, Ross and Hannah are going to talk a bit about their experience with the Medical Education SFP as well. 
Sure. Well, I, we invite Hannah to maybe speak first, given that she is an F2 um, and is a little bit closer to, to her experience of, of the SFP than I am being an F1. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, so yeah, I'm an F2 in Sheffield. Um, I trained in Norwich um, and I did a I did an MRES integrated degree in research. So I was really kind of weighing up whether I wanted to do the research or medical education one. Um, but I think in the end, I kind of decided that I didn't enjoy my research that much in my integrated degree. And I much uh, kind of enjoyed teaching, even though I think sometimes there's a bit of a perception that the medical education ones can be a bit easier than the research ones, um, which I'm not sure if that's fully true, but um, I think some aspects of that I agree with. Um, but anyway, so I'm, I'm in, I've just started F2, I'm in my GP placement and my F, my AFP block uh, is the last one of my F2. Um, so then that's quite nice to have that before I probably go into an F3 year, because um, it means it's a bit more chilled. Um, but yeah, in the green box there, you can see for the Sheffield one, we're going to be helping with uh, supervising anatomy classes, teaching sort of clinical skills, like teaching medical students how to take bloods and things. Um, and then, yeah, organising teaching and stuff. Um, and alongside that, over the two years, I'm doing a PG cert. So I've done two of the modules for it. And it's quite focused on uh, curriculum development. So, for example, we would talk about our own experiences of being a student and or teacher in a specific curriculum um, and then analyse it, basically. Um, and the PG cert is usually costs about three grand. Um, so they pay for that as part of the AFP, which is a big bonus because uh, extra qualifications like that come up quite a lot when you're looking at things like applying for onward training, surgery, um, medicine, everything. Um, so it is quite helpful. Yeah, I don't know if that's, I'm happy to answer questions at the end as well, but that's a brief rundown. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Hannah. And I, I don't have a huge amount to add to that apart from, I suppose I can, I can tell you a little bit about what I'm doing. Um, so I, I live in the north of Scotland, I live in Inverness, um, and the, the structure of my SFP um, will be that uh, I work as a, a medical education fellow um, at the Centre for Health Sciences, which is a, a large kind of simulation, um, mainly simulation type centre in Inverness, just next to the hospital. So I'm doing that in my first post next year um, at the start of F2 um, and it's mainly undergraduate teaching so I've spoken to a few people who have done it already and, and this is what they've, they've told me they've, they've done so mainly simulation board based simulation um, and clinical skills and um, small group teaching for students from um, most of the Scottish universities so um, Aberdeen, Glasgow, Dundee and Edinburgh um, Care days, uh, which I'm quite looking forward to. I'm quite into the, the sort of um, you know mass casualty and pretending that the trains craft type stuff. Um, and also the, they've been quite heavily involved in induction um, for 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 myself as a, as a new FY one. Um, but I, I've seen that they've been quite heavily involved in that as well. There is an opportunity to do a PG cert um, and uh, research methodology. It's not funded. Um, and you know, at this point in time, that will this might be changed. I don't anticipate that I will do it, um, partly because it's not funded, but also because um, I see myself doing an F3 or um, fellowship type jobs down the road, um, and I think for, for myself that's probably when I'll do that. But that just goes to illustrate, you know, that everybody's you know paths to the SFP and and their decisions as to what parts of it they want to use and what parts they don't want to use. Um, can be very different. One of the one of the things that, that I quite liked about Inverness is they're very big in their social media, um, and the department had. Uh, it very much depends on how keen the the fellows are at any point in time. But they have an Instagram page. They put up questions and you know, content based around medical education for for um, undergraduates. And I was just quite drawn to that, along with the location. And um, I have friends up here um, I quite fancy the, the, the clinical rotations that were on offer so um, that was sort of my, my thought process. Well, thank you so much and um, so now I'm going to talk a bit about the third main theme which is leadership and management um, and again same goes for the others it can either be sort of format block or disperse for our F1 and F2 but the theme with this the focus of this theme is improving skills as a leader, manager, and change driver. 
Um, so the learning outcomes, which again can be found on that document, include things like identifying opportunities for improvement, developing proposals and managing and overseeing projects of quality improvement, evaluating the effectiveness of these interventions, and then again, presenting and disseminating the results. Um, and this might be in the form of research projects, organising leadership conferences, and again, um, postgraduate qualifications in management and leadership. Um, we don't have a speaker at this webinar who has done a leadership or management post themselves, but we had um, George, who was a really great speaker on our first webinar, um, and he's very happy to be contacted with any specific questions about management and leadership. And again, we'll post his email in the email you get with your attendance certificate at the end. So feel free to contact him. Um, and this is just an example. This was, so I think this is in the northwest of England. This is one of the modules that they offer as part of their leadership and management postgraduate qualification. Um, and I just thought it was quite interesting to see the different sort of things which are covered in this. Um, so I'll just give you a moment to read that. And again, all of this type of information. So I think I've just got this by going on from the UKFPO website um, on the Specialised Foundation Programme page. And then all of the different uh, deaneries are on there and you can just click on them and it'll sort of give a link to the university and the, all the sort of things they cover. Um, so we definitely recommend whichever sort of areas you're thinking about having a look in detail at what sort of things are offered in each. Um, so we thought it was really important as well to caveat with all the benefits we've been saying about the specialised foundation programme, um, that there are cons to it as well, and it is entirely valid to decide not to apply. Um, and so we've put a few different examples here. Um, so as um, Ross alluded to before, um, especially at the moment, there are financial implications of doing these posts. Um, it varies in different deaneries, but in my deanery or in my job specifically, um, I don't have any on-call commitments during my four-month block, so you are paid base rate. Um, some do differ. I know that some you might have to still do weekends, um, but again, just look on whichever deaneries you're thinking about applying to. Um, I guess to caveat that, there is the opportunity to do locums um, outside of the hours which you're doing academic work. Um, you also have four months less to achieve all of the F1 and F2 competencies um, and you have one less job. So if maybe, for example, you're not sure what you want to do um, in F2, I suppose you could have very varied jobs and quite general jobs and get quite a lot of different experience. But by doing the specialised foundation programme, you have an entire less job, which might so you, I guess you have one less job that you're exposed to. Um, and also, I guess that might affect things down the line. So it's entirely valid to not want to do the um, specialised foundation programme to get as much clinical experience as possible and do things like research and teaching in your own time or alongside. Um, also in, I don't know if this varies by deanery as well, but certainly for, um, it was South Thames when I was applying, um, there was a swap shop in F2. So you're able to change um, with other, foundation doctors in that region jobs. So for example, if you really want to do cardiology and you didn't have a cardiology job, you could swap like your ED job for a cardiology job. Whereas with the specialized foundation program, we weren't able to do that, the jobs are set. Um, and I think in general, it is a lot more difficult to swap if you're doing a specialized foundation post. Um, and again, you do have to balance sort of your academic and clinical commitments. Um, and it's definitely not the only way to obtain experience and skills in research, medical education, or leadership and management. Um, and so it's entirely valid to decide not to apply whatsoever. It's not everyone enjoys doing it. And even if you are unsuccessful in the process, um, definitely don't be disheartened and feel as if you can't have a career which involves academia because you definitely can. Um, I guess this just gives you that dedicated time. Um, and I think Ross has a personal anecdote of someone he knows to sort of elaborate on this a bit more.
Okay, so um, we've just got a couple of, of anecdotes to share because uh, there's only so much experience we can we can bring to, to such a, a broad topic, um, uh, the two of us. Um, so we've we've got a few here, um, kindly um, contributed by by Naomi and Hilary. Um, we'll give you maybe a couple of minutes or, or just a minute or so to read this. I'm, I'm not going to read it out to you, but essentially it's, it's their their rationale for, for going for an SFP programme and, and, and also some, some hints and tips for their application process as well. And uh, this this webinar is recorded as well, and um, so we'll be able to get the recordings and the, and the slides out to you if you need to read through these again. Okay, um, I had a, a very short anecdote to share um, from a friend of mine who um, is now working in, in London as well. But there was some, you know, in, in the final year of university, he was, he was given some thought as to whether or not an SFP was right for him, um, having completed a master's at medical school and going down the research track. Um, being involved in uh, lab work, um, writing up and, and publication, uh, publish, publishing research, etc. Um, but ultimately, what he took away from that experience that was that, you know, trying to combine academia and uh, work, working clinically in the NHS, just wasn't a good fit for for them. Um, and there was a certain amount of um, expectations, or you know, personal expectations. To be an academic when actually you know there had been a, a taste he had a taste of it at university he'd enjoyed enjoyed that while it lasted but medicine pure clinical medicine was was what he was what he was keen for and um, so that again that just illustrates that to decide not to do the sfp is totally valid for for some people it will be the the, the correct decision for them um, and we're here partly just to give you as much information as, as we can to, to to widen access, but also just to make sure that you all you know, know what you're getting in for um, and make a decision that's that's right for you. Um, so what I think we're going to do now is just have a look at the questions um, in the chat. Um, I don't know how you want to do this, Ella, but will we, I think I'll have a wee look at what's there already. But if you've got any questions at all, feel free to um, put them in the chat and we'll pick them up and answer for you. There was one a bit earlier about um, uh, what, what kind of projects you do in an education SFP that I'm happy to talk about. Um, I haven't done my, SF, my AFP SFP rotation yet, but um, I know other people who have, and I think it's quite um, broad. There, at my, in my deanery, there's quite a few education posts. I think there's between 10 and 15. Um, and uh, you get a lot of choice as to what you want to do um, but it is like a small kind of research project I suppose that you're doing to try and measure the effectiveness usually of some sort of teaching program that you set up so whether that be I don't know a series of uh, revision, revision lectures I suppose quite similar to this you could do some sort of online thing um, and, and measure how effective that is but I think there is a lot of room for um, changing that um, so it's that kind of thing. It's definitely with like an academic education focus though, rather than it being like a clinical lab based project. Yeah, and I, I guess I can add, add to that, that based up here, from what I can tell, it's almost worth considering as you, you're an employee of the, of the medical education department, if that makes sense. So, you know, you work say nine to five, you have a timetable that says, 
Monday at this time you're helping with you know final year um, OSCE simulation or something and then in the afternoon you're doing a different thing um, and so there's opportunity to do some research in there but you're 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 almost running the running the department if that makes sense. Um, I've got a question I'll just start from the top um, can you apply to all three medical education research and leadership? Does anyone want to tackle that one? My my understanding is that and on audio, when you start to complete the white space questions, you have to select one discipline um, out of the three. Uh, I, I think that's the case. Uh, I'm not sure that you can apply for more than one um, in the same cycle. I may be wrong. Yeah, I so I think when I applied, you you just apply to two sort of specialised units of application. Um, but I applied to London and Bristol or South West, which I'm pretty sure both of them just offered research anyway. So I'm not actually sure whether sort of once you were within that, because then I did like rank the different jobs within that. But I'm not sure if they did offer teaching leadership, whether I would have been able to rank them. I don't actually know. I, I applied for um, uh, South Yorkshire um, and or I think Yorkshire comes as a whole, maybe. And then you do and then you kind of in on which part of Yorkshire um, and I also applied for North West London as well um, and that the London one was for a research post but then the um, Yorkshire one was for an education one so the interview was actually different for medical education compared to research so we didn't have any sort of critical appraisal um, ours was with a strong focus so there was two stations on clinical and um, uh, it was like a clinical station and then a station about you and your teaching experience which um, I'll talk about in like the, when we go, when we delve into the interview and do the webinars on that, then we'll talk more about each part um, in more detail. Yeah, so, so, so sorry, we, we, we can't answer that categorically, but I think it will, it will very much depend on the, the deaneries that you go for. Um, I only applied for one deanery, which was Scotland. And I do remember quite early in the process having to select one, one area of, of you know, one discipline, um, but your, your mileage may vary. Um, but sorry, we can't, we can't be more concrete on that. Um, as part of the research SFP, are there any wet lab type projects available or is it just clinical research? I think, again, that varies quite a lot um, by which deanery and which sort of university it's associated with. Um, but I think there definitely are wet lab projects available. Um, I think it's just worth looking at maybe whichever area you're interested in, looking at the university and then maybe even like the research outputs of the professors and academics that are associated with that um, university or area and seeing what type of research they're doing and whether that would be something you're interested in. Um, I've just had a, a question come to me by private message, um, just asking about um, whether I would recommend um, looking for a supervisor or project before applying. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear your guys' thoughts on this as well. But from my perspective, because my academic rotation is the last one of F2, it's quite far away from when you're first applying. So I would probably recommend not um, unless like unless there's something you're really keen to do, then you can do. You can start like uh, networking, getting to know what sort of teams or what sort of project focus you might want to look at. But I think in terms of organising it, it might be a little bit premature. And I think... Um, you probably just want to get to the place that you're going to and settle in um, first before like trying to um, you know start a whole project I think you know I don't think you need to do it that quickly yeah yeah no I'm agreed with that I'd, yeah um, no specific time frames but I'm at this point I'm still trying to figure out how my bleep works and, and how not to cause a disaster in the world so um, you, you don't have to be that that ahead of ahead of the curve Equally, there's, there's no harm in asking around, I suppose, but um, yeah. yeah. Um, we've got a question that says, oh, sorry, sorry, please do on. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I guess, especially before you know um, exactly which job and which department you are working in, like you still have to go through Oriel. And I guess even if you get in contact with someone, um, you'll still have to go through the whole process. So I, yeah, I don't think it's worth it quite yet. 
Would you say start interview prepping now or when we find out if we have an interview? I mean, so it, it's August. I think it's, I think you don't need to start prepping right now, to be honest. I think that there's a bit of a curve in terms of how, you know, how effective that will be um, versus time. And I think probably I would start, I think I started maybe a month before my interview, which some people might think that's quite short notice. I guess it depends on how you do that sort of thing. I tend to be somebody that crams and that seems to work for me, even though some people might argue that's not the best way to do it. Um, but I think um, it's probably good to wait for a bit and then um, maybe like a month or a few months beforehand start prepping for it because then you'll be a bit closer to finals. So when it comes to your clinical stations and things, when you're learning about, you know, I don't know, the acute management of asthma, um, revising it, for example, then it's right in the forefront of your mind rather than I think there definitely can be an element of burnout too soon with these things. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And, and the the white space questions, I think, will take up, a, 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 well, in my case anyway, took up a significant amount of my energy and time. And that was before I even knew I had an interview, if that made sense. This is it was quite a long process. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't preempt preemptively start to prep for interviews until so you know you, you've got an interview I suppose. Yeah definitely. i say the one caveat with that is maybe be prepared that you can find out you have an interview with quite short notice. I think with one of mine I found out and then I when I got on to then book the interview slot it was only a week later or maybe, yeah, I think it's like a week to 10 days. So I guess maybe with the caveat of if you are someone that does like to do things in advance, you can have quite short notice about interviews. Um, but yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's probably quite a good idea when you're doing your white space questions and you're writing about different projects that you've been involved with to make a note of the ones specifically that you've mentioned because they probably will get asked about in your interviews, especially if you're the one bring them up. Um, so you need to have a bit of a spiel as to what you did, what you learned from it that sort of thing um so you're kind of prepping as we're doing the white space questions as well cool and the next question i think i'll point towards you ella is uh, what are your views on applying to london for research i've been told that with no research outputs there is very little chance of being successful is that true um i would definitely just recommend applying i think you lose absolutely nothing by applying um i definitely didn't really back myself with getting in at all and really don't have that extensive CV. Um, and I think one of the anecdotes which we put previously, um, one of my friends has written that she didn't have any publications um, at all and got in to do research in London. And I think that quite a lot of my friends have said similar things. And I think it's a, certainly when I applied, um, and we'll go through this in more detail in the interview and um, white space questions, webinars but they are pretty much equally weighted so I think you can make up quite a lot of points for maybe not having as extensive research outputs um, with the interview so I if you want to go for it I would definitely recommend going for it again very very happy to be emailed with any specific questions um, but yeah I think it's always worth applying. I was just going to say as well because um, I applied for research in London and didn't, I didn't get an interview um, so just for, I'm happy to be transparent for the reason with this call, because I guess it helps you to make decisions about things. Um, I had uh, no research outputs. I didn't have any publications, any audits, anything like that. Um, I had a few random prizes from medical school for various projects or end of year exams. Um, I had an integrated master's degree, which was four out of five points, um, which was a bit different from how it's done now, because uh, I understand that they don't count um, the degrees but I think you can still list it as part of your educational achievements if, if I'm right um, and for EPM points I was in first SL and I didn't get an interview for London um, so I was scoring quite well on all the other aspects just apart from the sort of research outputs um, so I think it, I think it does kind of depend on where you're applying um, and it might have it might have been part of my white space questions that I didn't have enough of um, I don't know specific like prizes or something um, so I think it does depend, but I would still recommend applying because you still have another one. So with me, I applied to London thinking, hmm, maybe, but I was kind of more set on Yorkshire and then I didn't get in and I hadn't really lost anything because I sort of applied to somewhere else that was good as well. So I would recommend still applying. 
Cool. Um, we've got a question. When you apply for your SFP deaneries, is there any indication as to which hospital you'll be allocated to or are you able to rank the hospitals within the deanery? Um, from my personal experience, there were, in the north of Scotland, there were 12 teaching jobs, I think there were 12, and you, there was a big list, essentially, and each job was six post long, so six four-month rotations. All right. Yeah, six four-month rotations, and each post said general internal medicine, Raymore Hospital in Burnett's or General Internal Medicine um, Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, etc. And so it was it was made very clear which hospitals you'd be working at for each um, each each job. Let's call it a job, so or a post, so a post of six clinical rotations. Um, so it'll be very clear what you're ranking um, and where you're going to end up if you if you allocate things in specific orders. I think. Um... When I was applying, um, kind of, I guess one of the benefits we've not spoken about with doing an, an SFP is that um, it's quite common for um, for you to stay in the same place for two years if you're doing an SFP, as opposed to um, where I am at the moment. Um, some of my friends will do a year in Sheffield and then we'll do a year at a DGH in like Doncaster or Rotherham, for example, um, so that you get a bit of experience with a DGH and a teaching hospital, which actually I think is not a bad thing. I think there's definitely pros and cons to this. Um, but um, for me, it means that I know that I'm going to be in Sheffield for two years. Um, so then you can make kind of more plans, you know, um, in terms of where you want to live and things. Um, it just makes things a bit simpler. And also you already know the hospital, so it's quite easy to sort of locum and things. Um, yeah, so when I, yeah, I think when I applied, the only odd thing was that even though it said I was in Sheffield for... Um, all of my rotations in F1. Uh, my first rotation was urology, which was actually in a different hospital to my other rotations in respiratory and gastroenterology. So um, I actually had to move hospital in my second rotation, which was a bit strange. Um, but things like that happen just based on where certain specialties are based. Like, because if you've got two big hospitals that are in a major city, they're not all going to mm. have. Which question, how would you recognize? I think it's a kind of cool. Sorry, Hannah, I think I, I, I think you cut out for me. I've totally spoken over you, so please. Sorry, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, sorry about that. So, sorry, I've got a question here. Um, how would you recommend to revise? Uh, assuming this is for the clinical station or or any aspects of interviews, I think we'll just park that one, and it will be covered. Um, in due course, if that's okay. Um, does London have white space questions? I highly suspect it does. Uh, is that right? When I applied, it didn't. Um, I must admit, I haven't looked for this year or last year, um, but we will be doing a session on white space questions next week. Um, so we will go through that in a bit more detail. Um, but yeah, when I applied, I just wrote white space questions for Bristol in the Southwest. And London was more just based on your um, like educational performance score and presentations, prizes, et cetera. Sure. Um... I've been asked, now forgive me if this was not a question that was meant to be asked or aired publicly, but um, can you do a PhD search separately outside of an SFP if you're willing to cover the cost? So yes, you can, uh, as, as, as far as I'm aware. Um, With the, can, sorry. <laughs> I'd say that the only um, kind of, I suppose, negative of organising your own PhD search is you're kind of doing it off your own back. Like for me, it was quite nicely packaged and ready to go. And like they already knew that um, as part of my AFP, I have to have mandatory teaching days. Um, so it meant that I didn't have to fight with the rotor coordinators to be like, this is my day off, not a day off as in like a teaching day, <laughs> um, which they actually were teaching days. We actually did have to go into like university buildings and sit there with like a load of GPs and consultants and things in groups and talk about curriculum development. <laughs> um, but yeah, it meant that it was a, it, it was a bit easier but definitely like if if it's not included in your education sfp or or any other one and you want to do it um definitely organize it because you you know it's probably a bit easier to do it early on like when you're nearer coming out of university i think and mm. um, i think there's a question as well about I'm not sure we answered this when it cut off i didn't hear but it, it says can you clarify to what counts as a presentation and um, and i think with all of these things where it's not entirely clear 
my biggest advice would be to if you think you have something which can count to write it because the worst they can do is exclude it on your application form and I think it's the same with like prizes and things like that I think it's so much better just to write it they're not going all all they're going to do is be like oh that doesn't count that's not I don't know what their requirements are but national etc or not a real I don't know but the worst they can do is just discard it whereas actually if you don't write it because you think it might not count and it does count you're losing points which would be available to you and um, so I just recommend writing all that you can yeah that's a good point because I was I was terrified of getting grilled in my interview about um projects that I'd done that I thought were a bit rubbish um but actually they your interviews are so short they're usually about 20 minutes and we'll talk about this more in, an, in a later webinar but um, it's definitely worth writing it and just gather up all the points you can because part of this is about playing the game and you guys will learn that medicine, you know, onward applications are all about playing the game, so play it. <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think they do want to see more of a, like, enthusiasm and interest rather than you being, I don't know, published in really high-impact factor journals. I think if you've shown an interest and enthusiasm and done a few different things, I wouldn't worry about whether you think it's good enough. I just write it down. Yeah, and 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 when we say so, sort of what counts as a presentation? So typically, um, oral presentation of research. So that means whether you're standing on stage or you're talking over slides at a conference and you're presenting your work, or a poster presentation of research. So if you're standing in front of a poster um, at a conference work that you've done or and you're presenting that online or whatever so that that's that tends to be what they mean by i totally agree and um, they take a mile stretch definition of thing if you presented at a conference that you know you and your mum were there or something and um, just put it on and if they if they decide that it's not worth the points it's not but you've got a lot to gain by just putting it all on within within reason definitely um, just to confirm, for the SFP, is London and Kent combined into a uh, London, Kent, sorry, Sussex deanery? I'm not sure about that one. So I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, obviously with this um, lax deanery, I don't know, Ella, you might know more about this than me, but just from what I've kind of had a look at today, um, the, there are different sort of London um, deaneries, but I think some of them, some of the more like southern ones are encompassed in this deanery, is that right? So when I applied, and again I'm not entirely sure what it is this year because I think it has changed because um, in the foundation programme when I applied it was like northwest, um, northeast, northeast and central and south Thames and then but the AFP was just like London and um, whereas now I understand that for the foundation programme London is all one um, and I'm not entirely sure the answer to that question, um, but I will look into it and hopefully in the next few webinars we can give a bit more information on that. Sorry, I've, I've stopped sharing there just, just so I can look up some, some documents, but please do carry on. Um, just seeing the question about where can we find more information about the scoring system for SFP. So um, this will be very dependent on where you're applying um, and the best kind of, the, what I'd recommend doing is typing in um, whichever deanery you're interested in. So for me, that would be um, Yorkshire and Humber SFP um, interviews. And then it will come up with the document that gives you all the information. Usually it will say, um, it will give you links to things like the person um, specifications and the job roles. So you can have a read through and look at what they're looking for. Um, some of them will say um, about what they use to um, shortlist people. So they'll say whether they include EPM points. Some of them don't, um, surprisingly. Um, they'll talk about um, SJT, some of them, so they'll say um, we don't take it into consideration but you have to have like passed it or got a satisfactory mark in SJT to get to get into the AFP. Um, some of them will talk about this, they'll break it down and say we're looking at educational achievements, so prizes, publications, and it really varies by deanery, so some of them give super, super in-depth, um, broken down parts of what they're looking at, um, and also they break down the interviews and things, and some of them keep it quite closed and say that they're only sharing it with applicants so it's not publicly available until you apply um but definitely look yeah so here you go have a look at this <laughs> uh, you'll, 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 so i apologize but, um yeah we, we were quite spoiled in, in scotland and we made it very clear 
um, which I, I was quite thankful for when I applied. I don't think much has changed, but this is, so this, as an example, this is the, the Scottish Deanery. Um, you could submit a maximum of 10 presentations um, and they were very uh, strict with what that meant. I, you, you'll notice here, you know, the presentation must have, must have been accepted or taken place before the close of the application period. I presented on the 1st of November, something or other, and I put it down anyway, um, because I thought, why not? Uh, and they did, they did, in that case, they rejected it. But, you know, just stretch the, stretch the, the definition if you need to. Um, but yeah, so, you know, 10 presentations, um, they ask about the format of the interview, how much detail they give is, is pretty minimal. Um, and so this is all publicly available. Um, Decile scores not used, um, but maybe used in a tie break, etc. So, yeah, there's a lot of information um, online, uh, but deanery specific. Also, just FYI, because I've had a few messages from people during this call saying that they think about applying to Yorkshire and Humber. There are no interviews this year for Yorkshire and Humber, so it's purely based on your. I'm not even sure if they're doing white space questions. I think it's purely based on the things that you submit about educational achievements, which is different from when I did it. Um, but I don't know if, if you're not so good at an interview, that might be a good thing. Yeah, and I think they are, they update and publish quite a good document with all the different deaneries and what posts they're offering this year. It's not quite up on the UK FPO website yet, but I'd keep checking in onto that website, um, which will email you the link just to see, because it will give quite a lot of good information on there. questions feel free to ask guys and um, so is this information you submit on Oriel or do you write about all of that in your white space questions and um, so again I think it differs deanery by deanery but so, so for example like the publications and prizes etc are different to that in your white space questions you'll have to sort of like manually input each of them onto Oriel um, and then the ones that require white space questions will be like a later tab in the Oriel application process. I don't know if that was the same with you guys. Uh, yeah, I think it was. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, just seeing the question about leadership and education interviews, are they the same as research ones? Um, I can't really speak for leadership interviews. You guys might know a bit more than me, but for my education interview it was um a 15 minute clinical station and then there was a 15 minute station about my teaching experience so it is quite good to what you're applying to um some of them like i think for like oxford and possibly maybe for some of the east of england ones they have like one panel that consists of both um clinical um slash academic questions and it's not necessarily um like split up you know, so that it's there's a clear distinction between which questions they're asking. I think sometimes they just do one panel and just ask you bits here and there. Um, whereas mine was very distinct. It was like, right, next part of your interview, you're moving into um, talking about your teaching experience. Um, so yeah, I think, whereas the research ones tend to have a critical appraisal. So because I was applying for London, I prepped for that too, by finding sort of like research articles and listening to the Access the SFP um, webinar on it. Yeah, and I think yeah. I think it's in two weeks. Sorry, I think it's in two weeks' time. We'll go through um, all about the interview and hopefully give some good tips then. Um, but yeah, mine mine was quite structured as well. I had um, a critical appraisal one, a sort of clinical emergency one, and then one talking a bit about myself. And when I did it, it was on Microsoft Teams, and it was like you went into different rooms for each. So it's quite nice because it was different people each time. So you could kind of start over. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I think somebody, one of my interviewee, when interviewers was an infectious diseases consultant. So I was like, oh no, he's going to ask me loads of questions about infectious diseases, but that did not happen. <laughs> um, I've just had a question here from somebody as well saying, do they ask for any evidence of teaching e.g. feedback forms? Um, they didn't for me. Um, I would... I mean, I would recommend not making up the teaching that you're doing, because I suppose there are ways of sort of finding out. Um, but uh, in terms of it, even if you don't have feedback forms, I would still talk about it. 
Um, like I was a PBL tutor during my master's and I spoke about that. I had no sort of formal written down feedback, but um, that made up a large part of what I spoke about in the interview. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree with that. So if, if you have um, stuff lying in like teaching portfolio type stuff, so um, feedback forms or specific, pardon me, specifically good experiences, I would use them, try and get something out of them in terms of using them to answer your white space questions or mentioning them um, in your interviews using a kind of a restructure like, you know, this is what I did and this is why it was really good and that's why I'm, I'm going to carry forward from it. You can you can find some sort of use for for everything, even if it's not specifically asked for as, as evident. Um, just while we have quite a few people still on the call, um, I'm just going to shamelessly plug the Instagram, which is access the AF SFP even. Um, please, can you give it a follow? Because um, I am going to, if you guys think this would be helpful, I'm going to get different um, people doing different um, SFPs and kind of do like mini interview style things, um, like short clips, reels, whatever on um, Instagram, just to kind of condense some of the best bits and worst bits of each SFP. Um, so that would be really helpful. Thank you. Sorry, and, and totally forgot as well. We've got a feedback form, um, so we really would appreciate if, if you if you enjoyed um, this evening's webinar and you have any positive or negative feedback, um, we we take it all and and uh, yeah, please do take the time to to fill out the form. Equally, if you have any more questions, um, I think Ella has put our email addresses and our, our well put the email addresses um, and any correspondence that you'll, you'll receive after this. Um, so feel free to, to email.